two people that can't be killed against a dog and a woman that can be killed. But, you know, let's make a stand. And so they run off to go set up an ambush for them so that they can make that final stand. Meanwhile, they have buried Atticus's body, and Atticus comes too because he did something back in the 19th century during um, uh, Napoleon's attempt to conquer Russia so that essentially... He has this charm on his necklace, and so that essentially what it is, is it, it, in the event that he is shot by a projectile, whatever, and his brain is rendered, or his body is rendered lifeless, essentially, what happens is his soul stays in his body, his uh, healing charm automatically gets triggered, and all his memories are kept intact. Um, I'm, I'm thinking in the future I'm going to do a, a show just explaining the full extent of this iron amulet and the charms around it. Because I don't think I'm doing a good job of explaining it in these shows. But suffice to say, Atticus doesn't die. And so he rises from the dead. And with the help of the elementals, tracks down Graduel and Oberon, who are now in battle with the Huntresses, and he comes up and they secure the battle. They secure the win. Woohoo! So, they continue running, <laughs> and they make it to France where they feel like they have enough of a head start because of some shenanigans and trickery that they uh, pulled back in Germany or the Netherlands, actually, um, with this ambush, that they, that they could spend the day just in uh, Calais. And they're going to a restaurant to have a nice, lovely dinner, just the two of them, when guess who shows up? Leif fucking Helgerson. Leith fucking Helgerson has been working in cahoots with Theophilus, the um, head vampire, the oldest and most powerful vampire in the world. <clears throat> uh, so Leith is, has been working with him, but he's also been sort of tipping off Atticus. And so what, what we find out is that these dark elves and the vampires, well, I mean, the vampires have their own vendetta because druids can just, like, unbind them and kill them instantly. I mean, can you kill something that's already dead? I don't know. But they could end their existence instantly with this unbinding. And, um... And Leaf reveals that a lot of this is being orchestrated by someone in Tirn and Oak. Actually, he probably revealed this earlier on elsewhere. Actually, maybe he revealed it in Trapped and I just forgot to mention it. Anyways, so that's something to think about. Um, but Leaf then says, look, you're about to get attacked by some vampires and this guy, Verna Drosha, I hope I'm, I'm pronouncing that right. <laughs> Verna Drosha, who um, is an arcane life leech. And so basically, like, he was an accident. This Verna character was an accident of alchemy or experiment gone wrong slash right. And so what he has is this ability to suck the life force out of people just by looking at them. Which keeps him young, keeps him strong, keeps him powerful, gives him, like, unbelievable crazy healing powers. And, um, yeah. But, hey, I mean, he can also kill them. But just, like, look at them. He can kill them with a single thought and take all their life force and boom, they're dead. Right? 
So Leaf warns them about this, and so Atticus and Granuel go, all right, we've got to cross the English Channel. We've just got to cross it now as fast as possible. Except the um, Olympians have sent Neptune and Poseidon to try and fuck them over, (laughs) because now the Huntresses have caught up, and so Neptune and Poseidon are trying to help them across the English Channel, and they've also recruited the children of the sea serpent, Jormungandr, to try and kill Atticus and Granuel in their um, aquatic forms, which, like, it's very clever. Like, I, I still kind of don't know how they managed to think that this was going to work, even with all this. You know, even if, if all that wasn't going on with Neptune and Poseidon and the Leviathans and all that stuff. So, but then the Celtic sea god, uh, Manon and McLear, comes to the rescue and gets them across the English Channel safely. And they're like, yay, hooray, Manon and McLear. We love you. And I love Manon. And. <laughs> he makes me laugh. Um, so they get across, they get to England. They get to Windsor Forest, and they meet up with Hearn the Hunter, who is possibly a ghost, but possibly not. His exact supernatural state is unclear, because on one hand, he could be a ghost, because uh, surely at some point in time he was an actual subject of like Richard the Third and he was a big hunter and he had like oak trees and stuff like that. But then obviously he died. Um but then Shakespeare gave him a shout out in The Merry Wives of Windsor. So people I guess believe in him. But at the same time there's a sort of speculation that he could be a manifestation of the human belief in like the quote unquote horned god because he wears antlers and so it's a really weird to try and explain Hearn the Hunter but whatever Windsor Forest is where Hearn the Hunter roams that's his forest that he protects and if you can get him to say yes you are my guest or you know be my guest without the musical number then he will not only protect the forest, he will protect you. So there, so they get to Windsor, they get the protection of Hearn the Hunter, and then out of nowhere, here comes Slittish, hooray! Out of an old way that nobody knew about. And, um, epic battle, in, or epic battle ensues with Artemis and Diana, who finally catch up. And Atticus says... All right, Gaia, the Earth, loves Druids more than Olympians. Druids trump Olympians in the eyes of Gaia because we actually take care of Gaia. We actually take care of the Earth. They use it. They use it. They use it and they fuck it over because you've got Pan and Faunus causing pandemonium and making things feel weird and crazy. Oh, 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 and something else happened. Um, But no, let me tell you what he did to Artemis and Diana. So anyway, so he goes, okay, Gaia loves us more because we're druids. So they hack the Huntresses to pieces and then have Albion, the elemental of that area, uh, encase them in clay or something like that and hide them in the ground. At which point, Jupiter and Zeus are like, oh, fuck no. And so they show up to start negotiations. And Atticus goes, look, dude, I will give you Artemis and Diana back. I will give you fucking Bacchus back. Leave me the fuck alone. And they're like, oh, no, 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 no. You are a dick. And he's like, yeah, I know. Um... 
But in the middle of these negotiations, which are hilarious, scary but hilarious, uh, here comes Loki again. He has escaped the Polish coven with the unwitting help of the Finnish thunder god Uko because the Finnish thunder god or the Finnish deities sort of hate the Norse deities because the Norse deities have more believers nowadays and so Uko sees Loki and goes oh I hate you and like hits him with thunderbolts which uh, negates the charms of the Polish witches and Loki goes free and so here he comes to wreak havoc which sucks they subdue him or, or, or they don't subdue him Hell comes his daughter Hell comes around and joins the battle a little bit but manages to go off with with Loki and, and they walk away. And so Atticus says, that, fucking that is what you need to be working worrying about. Loki wants to start Ragnarok. And so you need to be on the right side of that because otherwise the world's gonna burn and you're gonna cease to exist because there are gonna be no people left to believe in you. And the Thunder Gods go, okay. <coughs> so all or the thunder gods the olympians go okay so they uh they forswear that they're not gonna you know hunt him down anymore and um jupiter and zeus swear it uh pan and faunus swear it hermes and mercury swear it and then they bring up the the encased remains of Artemis and Diana and like kind of, you know, just let their little heads peek out. And um, Artemis says, you know what, fine, I'm done with this. Diana, on the other hand, is still fucking pissed off. And Jupiter says, you know what, fuck you, Diana. <laughs> and he has uh, Atticus put her back in the ground until she can behave. So keeping his end of the bargain, Atticus brings Bacchus back from the time island, but he warns them, he's like, look, he is in full, like, Bacchanalia mode, and, um, and things could get out of control, just letting you know. So, he grabs Bacchus off the time island, Bacchus has lost his mind, and because Bacchus has lost his mind, and this is what happens with Bacchanalia, everybody else starts losing their mind and starts attacking each other. Atticus manages to get Oberon out of there. Shift back to Tiernan Oak. He is protected from the Bacchanalia because of his iron amulet. At this point, I realize that I probably should mention that earlier in this epic battle with Loki and shit, or actually with the Huntresses, I think, uh, Granuel gets injured, so... After they have subdued the goddesses, uh, Atticus takes a whole hot second to heal up Granuel as best he can, just a little bit by little bit, and then he shifts her over to um, Mamel, I think, or no, maybe it's Govnu in Tirnanog. I can't remember. I feel horrible. <laughs> I didn't do my homework. Oh. But in any in any event, he gets her off of off of that plane of existence and into one of the Celtic planes of existence to heal up. So she's not there for Loki. But Atticus manages so so uh, Bacchus comes back and um, everybody goes crazy and starts trying to kill each other. And uh Atticus manages to shift himself and Oberon uh, off to Tirnanog and catch up with Granuel. And at this point, he's kind of curious about who in Tirnanog is cahooting. <laughs> is that a word? <laughs> with uh, dark elves and vampires to get rid of him. And he has a suspicion. So he goes to the castle home, whatever, 
of this guy Mears, who is his prime suspect. 